Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the semi-finals of the uh, um, the Slovenia volleyball post Ivers amazing competition. Congratulations to all four teams for being here. In opening, in opening government, we have Adam and Aliona. In opening opposition, Neva Hachim. In closing government, we have Sam Lucas. And in closing opposition, Neva and Joan. Um, you all know the rules by now. Are there any questions before we begin with the debate? Now on the topic, roughly approximating this house would send United Nations international peacekeeping troops to Sri Lanka. Is that pretty much what you've got? Good. Um, <laughs> I, I call upon Adam to propose a motion. This <laughs> It's never wrong to read the newspaper or to have some knowledge before one decides to invade a country or to help a country out. In that case, it's not an invasion. So we are also not so strict with our knowledge in that case. But we still present you a case, Mr. Speaker. The model is quite quickly answered by the notion we are sending a peacekeeping group of the United Nations to Sri Lanka. We will elaborate shortly on that. Then we come to the problem analysis. Why is the question? Then we move over to the added, added value of a new ad, uh, contribution. Does it work? And finally, we look from a more principled perspective at the United Nations duty. Why, why should it? I mean, even if it works, we still have all to ask that question. In the beginning, was Sri Lanka uh, is, is a civil war. So the model is basically a policing force. We're not going there to make peace enforcement in the way that we are targeting certain groups of the conflict and trying to fight or struggle them down, uh, not unless we are attacked. This is basically the idea behind our mandate. Um, so um, the idea is quite simple. There is a very complex conflict, and every peace negotiation between those conf uh, conflict groups um, can easily be disturbed if only one decides to fight again. So we want to have a third party army, which simply is policing. Yes, Ella, you just said Sir, how do you comment the fact that the United Nations already had peacekeepers in Sri Lanka and withdrawn them in September because there was uh, because the Sri Lanka government cannot could not guarantee safety for those peacekeepers? How powerless. That means you shouldn't go there only because you're afraid that they shoot to you. We say we have to have a more solid mandate told you it's not a peace enforcement mandate, but it should be a solid peacekeeper mandate, which has, well, enough tanks and rifles to shoot back, because that's what we expect. We expect that at some point in time, some group might attack, and we have to simply be prepared for that. And going somewhere with a rifle and then say, oh, well, nobody could guarantee our security. Yeah, exactly, it's about that you are there to guarantee security and not they secure your security, which is a bit of a ridiculous point. But I, I believe Eva is completely right. The United Nations is often suffering exactly from that problem, that we are declaring rhetoric willingness to Sir. help, and then we are not willing um, to take the consequences. Let's go a bit deeper into the problem analysis. Um, the issue is Sri Lanka is far away, and some of us may have seen it at a map. Um, it's an island, they have tea, and they have a conflict which is long-standing and as far as we remember, in the north there are the rebels, Tamil Tigers, is one of the big groups, in the south we have the government. There's Sorry. some there's some issue. Uh, this is basically the, the easy constellation. Um, the state sovereignty doesn't extend fully over the whole territory. In the north, there are the terrorists. Uh, ter oh, sorry, uh, they are rebels. Maybe they even have a legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's, I got so much used to call them terrorists. Um, yeah, so they are fighting each other, but it's almost like two countries in one because the Tamil Tigers have effective control over the northern part. And, but that's not everything, not now. That's not everything. There are other groups. There are even militarized Buddhists, which we never have seen everywhere else in the world, militarized Buddhists who are fighting. And that leads us simply to an easy conclusion. Okay, this conflict is long standing. <coughs> this conflict involves Sorry. many groups, and this conflict apparently happens in a vacuum of power. That means it's not so easy to communicate. It's especially not so easy to uphold a peaceful negotiations between those groups. And here we say United Nations is a perfect third party agent Sir. 
to help that situation. Yeah, he also will the UN peacekeepers be as successful in Sri Lanka as they were, I don't know, in Srebrenica, for example? Um, I hope we can learn from the past, and that should be uh, also a criteria when we are sending certain troops next time. Please don't say they are shooting us and then run away and do nothing when they are slaughtering civilians. The UN exactly should have a more solid mandate here. We hope for the best. But now, a, a final issue on the problem, so, and here we, here we link to the UN contribution. What is the whole idea of a third party having on the ground? Well, the idea still should be, we think these groups have all an interest in some kind of negotiated peace settlement. They might have different interests, but still they have an interest in some kind of result. If that's the case, we can support a process. And we think we can support it via having this policing function. We say the central government cannot do the policing itself, since it's not accepted by all conflict parties as a third or objective authority here standing uh, next to the conflict. The same the other way around. Would you as a member of the central government agree that the Tamil Tigers are uh, policing the peace process? The UN can do something, and this has a very practical implication. In a conflict with many parties, we have also many conflict diets, or well, pairings, let's call them. Yeah? Everyone could theoretically have a conflict with everyone. This could overlap, and it can change from one day to another. So if you have a peace process going on, and only one of these complex relationships suddenly changes overnight, the whole process will suffer, because nobody can know really what, where it's heading to, uh, especially if it's mobilized by ethnic groups, uh, by, by the mobilization of ethnic groups, because those conflicts tend to spill over to have a much broader scope. So we say, in our mandate, we are basically the third, the blue helmet group, who is the nice guy, as long as you don't shoot to us, and is overseeing the conflict, um, the peace negotiation process. What my partner will elaborate on is basically, having said all that, I mean, we can go on for ages to say whether the United Nations could in theory do that, or in practice has done that so far. The question is also a more principled one. Um, maybe we don't solve everything, but can we contribute something? If we can contribute something, do we have a duty to do that? And we believe the United Nations, of course, had, because it's nothing, it's not an international organization, it's rather the representation of the international community and the international conscience as such. That means if there is a huge conflict which threatens indirectly international peace and security, because it kills people on the ground, people on the ground, then we think the United Nations has a duty to act. And this is basically what I will present you. What have we brought you here today? There is some conflict somewhere. Sri Lanka, there is the problem, and we think we should help. Thank you very much indeed. Now to open the case for the opposition in this debate, I call on Greta. the role of the peacekeepers. What, what they can really do there, you know, what, what they can achieve, what effectiveness the peacekeepers has, have when they come in. And what, what I was showing in my speech is that they will create even more harm, if the, we can create even more harm if we send them than if they stay out. Because at the first time, they, they shouldn't be effective, but as they, they define it, uh, it's, it's so many uh, different uh, groups, different uh, different groups that are on, they will at one point come to the shooting and they will, they will have to react, but that's not the role. They, it's not good definition, but okay, we will go to that. But firstly, uh, uh, let's go to the uh, next summary battle. Um, like, <laughs> nobody knows. All these things, like, like all, all these things that there's a lot of different groups, uh, and there, there's like a lot of confusion, like nobody knows where really it's going to. Like, goes to our point like it's like an international affair like 
and we should not go in there because it's like the, the, the government's case. The government is the one, the role, the role is who should be put and uh, uh, remain, the state is remain together, you know, and that we should not interfere because it's like in a turn on affair of it, like all these things, uh, military, uh, uh, all, all different military groups, all, all, all these things, it's like the basic role of the government is like uh, they should uh, stabilize things because if you stabilize, it's uh, the the state could work, everything can work, and that's good for the people. And that's why the government role is to to put and uh, and leave the, the 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 state together. If if we yeah. have such a succession su 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 war, like we have one group who wants to go away, like it's happening in their like. You know, Tigers, they have like an idea to create a new state. It's the government role who said, no, we should have one state because if you are doing this, you create violence, you are creating instability and all these things, sure. what is not good for the people. And that's what is really is happening there, you know. We have this group of, of Tigers uh, called rebellions and we have the government. And the government is just doing their job. She, they want to protect the people uh, and to stabilize the, 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 the whole thing, you know. And, so, and, yes, go. So, uh, how do you expect the government to provide uh, security when there are multiple ethnicities and groups and, involved? Okay, okay, and how the, the United Nations would do it, how the peacekeepers would do it, you uh, didn't show us how they would do it, you know. I said it's better for us to, to just leave the government should do the, the role that they have it. Like, it's the basic role, like, let's go to our country, let's st uh, stay our country together, like, let's, should it stay together, together no? What we will create, like, we will just some more of confusion. We will get another army force in there. There will be like more, uh, uh, more uh, guns and more uh, uh, other kinds of weapon. And at one point, they will start to shoot, you know, because like the, the, all these rebellions don't give a damn about <laughs> the United Kingdoms and all these things. They, what they see is just another army force. At the one point, they will start to shoot, but it's the wrong definition. You, uh, the the, uh, the like of the role, role of the peacekeepers is. They, they, they shouldn't start shooting at any point. But whenever they start shooting, they are putting on one side. Like, and they, the role of the, the peacekeepers is like, they have to be objective. Like, they, they shouldn't have an alliance on any kind. Because when that, this starts, it's created only bigger conflict. Because the uh, other group that they are not supporting in this conflict, they see like, okay, another, another enemy, it's just another enemy. So we should fight on them once more. Yeah, but what do you think it's good? I mean, if they all hate the United Nations, they will like each other much more in here. <laughs> <laughs> no. Because, like, at one point, when, when uh, one of these rebellion group will start shooting in the United Nations, uh, they will uh, shoot them again, and uh, against them. Like, United Nations will, or uh, peacekeepers will go with them, uh, shoot them. And they will say, no, they're not with us. They're with another group, I don't know, with the government or with the tigers. It doesn't matter. But they will just see another one, another enemy, nothing else, just another enemy. And we are creating just more confusions, more shooting, and more war. war. And we are not stabilizing what should the role of the peacekeepers be. And this, you should listen to this one. Like, they already got an agreement, like it's the last news. And no, this also go to our point on internal affair. They can do it, you know? They can do it on their own. Like, they already got an agreement, so they, they can do it. No, no, they can deal with it. The government is doing good job because they, they, they some come, uh, some come uh, stop, stop the, the war, stop the dishonest instability because they, they reach an agreement. <laughs> so that's why we are just saying it. It's, the, the, it's an eternal affair. We should not intervene in it because the government is really doing really good job. Because he is like stabilizing state and he is making it as a whole. So that's why we, should, we, should, we, we at this point once again they can so, do it. Yes, go. Uh, what kind of agreement do they have? Like they have uh, um, uh, this is just temporary. temporary agreement of stopping or shooting. And this is the first step, you know, when, when you have an agreement, they stop, shoot, like, then you can start on the negotiation, because you cannot negotiate with the guns, so it's really good first step, really good goal. And as I said, like, uh, and, and it's a really good uh, example, like in Srebrenica, what the peacekeepers has done, they were just standing beside when, when the, the, the Serbs, no, no the Bosnian Serbs shoot out of uh, Bosnians, 
and they, they couldn't do nothing. Their arms were like uh, tied. It was like, because it's the, the main thing is like, they have to be objective. They shouldn't put on anybody's sides. So they cannot uh, actively go and uh, intervene into the, into the whole situation. And that definition was not quite good. They also, when, when they shoot back, they, it's really hard to, to say that, that they should defend, but not too much, you know. <laughs> yeah, but it, the role of peacekeepers, like, they have to be objective. Uh, when they start shoot, another side see an enemy on it. And as we said, it's an eternal affair. They're doing pretty much good job, the government, uh, to, to stabilize. They, they're to stop shooting. And uh, also because the role of peacekeepers is really, at the start, it, it's ineffective. Like, as a, a definition, it's ineffective because they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't have been actively. And that's all, all, all these things we have shown you. That's why uh, the uh, peacekeepers is not a good choice. Thank you. Thank you very much for that speech. Now to continue the case for the proposition team, I call the second speaker, Aliona. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The way I'm going to proceed today is basically fourfold. I'm going to speak about the UN and what is usually behind the mission expectations of the UN and the reasons on which we can base UN effectiveness. I'm going to speak about Sri Lanka government and why we believe they will be either capable or not capable of enforcing peace. I'm going to also speak about the nature of the civil conflicts and why quite open peace peacekeeping missions actually are being sent to the areas of the civil conflict and why civil conflicts don't solve on their own. And I'm going to finally speak about this external bully randomness effect, which my partner had introduced, about uniting the nation versus a common new external enemy. Now, first of all, speaking about this whole idea about the government is doing a good job and what's going on in Sri Lanka. The, the fundamental problem there is that if you're making a country which consists of several ethnicities, which speak several languages, and with to a certain degree do not like each other, there comes a problem. If you imagine that they're actually living in separate towns based on the certain ethnicities, religion, and language in which they're speaking, and they do not like to be crossing the border and walking all the way to another village to talk to each other, this is the problem. You also have the Tamil Tigers rebel group, which is also somewhere up in the north, which has certain support of certain of those ethnic groups, while not the others. And this is the problem. The government does not want necessarily to negotiate with the Tamil Tigers, and there is a certain population which actually support. The government also not necessarily represents every one of those ethnic groups, which we can call the stakeholders in this conflict, and this is again the problem. We say for actually successfully solving the severe civil case problem, you do need to involve all stakeholders at case and bring them all to the negotiating table. Yes, please. Madam, but the fact is that in the 25 year old long civil war, the government has now for the first time taken the control over the area that was, that was pre previously controlled by the rebels. Um, I would still doubt that, madam, in how far actually they do have control of that. Because once you even announce that you're going to stop, uh, stop shooting and cease the fire and you try to respect the borders, we believe it's the threat to this negotiation of the peace comes. If at least even one of those Tamil Tigers is simply going to break three and start shooting, we believe that the whole fragile peace constellation is going to fall apart. And this is why we believe to actually secure the peace negotiation process, we would like to send the UN peacekeeping troops yet again. And this brings me to my whole idea about why do we all so much love and admire UN, UN peacekeeping missions. Now, when we expect something from the mission, there are certain elements we, it needs to have. First of all, the expectations of all the other countries behind the UN when they send this mission. How strong is the message? How strong is the will of the rest of the world? and expectations that this mission has to go to that country and actually be successful. And we say this is an important factor. If the rest of the world finally takes a strong stance on Sri Lanka and finally believes they need a stronger solution and an external state, you have a more stronger kind of legitimacy behind the UN peacekeeping missions because they simply cannot turn back anymore because there's this all big expectations behind what a UN force should do. Second of all, it depends on the nature of the mandate which that peacekeeping operation has. If they don't have a mandate to start shooting back to defend the territory which they're doing, they simply will have to flee. That is why we said that we actually would like to introduce 
kind of a mandate which will simply be standing between the borders of all the different ethnic groups in Sri Lanka, separating them in case Tamil Tigers or any other groups decide to break through or violate the peace agreement, then they're going to stop to protect the groups. And this is wh why we're speaking about the fragility of the civil wars and having multi-ethnic groups which don't like necessarily each other. It is enough for one group or even one person within that group to break three. <coughs> one fragile constellation of the peace negotiation process can actually fall. And we don't want to wait for 25 years of expecting some kind of agreement just because some radical group is going to break free and fall apart. And this is the problem. When you make a survey in Sri Lanka of different ethnic groups, and you ask them if they believe there is a certain way to the democracy and peace negotiation, some of them actually say, maybe we can't even negotiate with the Tamil Tigers. Some of them believe that they shouldn't. But the whole idea is that they say if one group does not agree to the whole package of democratic government, if the whole group does not agree on how the constitution for them is going to look like, they say they won't sign that constitution. And this is the problem. If you really want to achieve a peace settlement and form a government and make them a proper constitution, you will need to bring all the stakeholders to the table and you will have them to negotiate on the full package. And that is why we say we bring the UN mission there with the strong expectations behind this mission of not turning their back, of not failing yet again. And we hope this is going to be the first successful UN peacekeeping mission yet to prove why we need the United Nations. <coughs> now, also, Madam. moving on on the point of the government. We believe that the government is trying to do a good job. We believe the government can be doing a better job. But we also necessarily believe the government does need a help, in especially in the fragile peace settlement process. We believe we can help them by providing external security, by providing security to different ethnic groups, which are crucial stakeholders in this process, and thus actually help them to achieve the peace settlement process faster. Yes, Eva. Madam, do you think that the United Nations peacekeepers or their diplomacy forces should help any leader of any country despite the policies that they're leading otherwise? You mean the, if, whether the government should actually do despite this? Sure. I say yes. I say that if there is a conflict, if that conflict hurts people, if that conflict poses peace and security to the rest of the world, we say we come and help. And now finally, on the nature of the, civils, of the civil wars. The problem with the civil wars is that they often involve multi-ethnic groups. They often involve irrational ways of one ethnicity believing that the other one is not good enough. And they often don't end quite fast. They often are very painful and don't end without external force coming and helping them to achieve a peace settlement. And one of the crucial components of those is indeed bringing all the relevant stakeholders to the table and ensuring that they're going to have a peace settlement. And then when we say why another reason why you need the UN peacekeeping troops, peace mission coming there, because we believe this is a case of a civil conflict, and it has not just two parties coming <coughs> there, it has multiple ethnic groups, multiple stakeholders involved, and it has another radical group in terms of the rebels, which actually won't mind screwing up the whole peace negotiation process. You cannot expect them to go and follow the government's proposal, they don't like the government. And that is why we say if we actually want to achieve certain productive results, we believe let's first give a test and let UN for the first time prove a successful UN peacekeeping mission with a strong expectations, with a proper mandate, and with appropriate force and logistics for this mission. Not something like in the Congo when you actually have finally the pipe point and it doesn't have enough truth soldiers in that necessarily point to defend. So we say if you provide logistics, the political message behind and the mandate, UN can do a good job. And we say this is also exactly because we do believe in the fragility of the peace negotiation process and thus we do want to help Sri Lanka. With all the words, I beg you to propose. Thank you very much for that speech. Now it's a continued case for side opposition. I call on their second speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So basically, first of all, what I would like to say is what is the government trying to do? They are going to introduce another target into Sri Lanka and they will hope for the best, as was presented by the first speaker of the government. 
Well, we don't see that as a really convincing line for the government's argumentation. Now, but basically, also one thing I would really like to point out is that well, the, both the first and the second speaker were talking about high expectations. So basically, what happened in the debate on, on the first half of the debate was that the government took on itself the burden of preventing practically every single attack by any group and trying to prevent every single violence escalation in Sri Lanka by any group because what the government, both of the government speakers were saying that any violence by any group, any group, any group of people, any and or any even single individual is going to threaten the negotiations and this is why we need to send the United Nations in. So we don't really see this working because we don't, because the United sure. Nations simply, no thank you sir, because the United Nations simply don't have the capacity to babysit every single person in Sri Lanka making sure they will at any point on during the negotiations, no thank you, not causing violence. So you can see that in this in this in this particular debate, the government has to on too much of a burden that they cannot really deliver through the tool that are they are using, which is the United Nations. No thank you. Next thing I would like to talk about is do we really need the United Nations? Because what has all what has been brought up in the points of points of information and the first government well, first opposition speech was that we already have a ceasefire agreement in Sri Lanka. Lanka, and also that the state has increased its influence and has been able to stabilize the state to a certain point. So do we really need the United Nations? To, no, thank you. So do we really need the United Nations to intervene here? First of all, no, because the situation is evolving and the situation is solving itself as it is right now. So why would we introduce a third party? Why would we introduce a new armed force into Sri Lanka if we are already solving the problem, yes, madam. To get 200% of this peace negotiation process is not going to break down? I'm sorry. To introduce a stronger security that this negotiation process is not going to break down? Yeah, but well, yes, but what you're saying, but, but you, the United Nations cannot cannot uphold the burden that you have set up for yourself as a first point, as a first response to that point of information. And also they are saying that without the United Nations, we will have no peace agreement. Without the United Nations, we will have no stability. But what is happening is if we already have increasing stability and we also have negotiations and certain agreements among the different parties, sure. no, thank you, which means that what the government is trying to do with a very ineffective plan and too much of a burden is already happening. So why send the United Nations in? The next point, no thank you. The next point I, want, I would like to talk about is also that, uh, is also what can the United Nations do? How, it, how effective can they really be? Because what was excellently brought up you know, by, the, by the opposition teams was that they moved out. You know, the United Nations already moved out because they recognized that they have no their, their, that their presence has no significant influence on the situation, and also, no, and also that they cannot uphold the situations. Uh, that they cannot uphold the situation being just another target. What the government, what the Sir. government is proposing. No, thank you. And also, when we are talking about power, when we are talking about influence, they want the state to be more influential. And the way they are doing it, is, it the, the way they are doing it, is by introducing another power. How exactly is state of Sri Lanka going to demonstrate ability to stabilize the country if they will be depending on the United Nations? And also if we further that, we also have to take a look at the long-term consequences of every conflict that the United Nations got themselves involved in was that their presence was then ever perpetual because because the, the state itself, because it was depending on the United Nations, was never able to really demonstrate the power it needed to, to form a cohere, a cohere, uh, to form any coherent strength. So what we're seeing on the side of the opposition is not only that the United Nations cannot do it, but also that there will be a negative effect of actually decreasing the, uh, the power of the, of the state of Sri Lanka and thus endangering the negotiations and the stability furthermore. Also, uh, also, what I would like to talk about is whether or not the United Nations will actually be accepted as a third party, which was also one of the arguments of the government. Because what they were saying basically is that the problem of the current conflict would actually, would actually has a ceasefire at the moment is that these are different parties involved into a conflict who hate each other. Now, what, what, and they said that we should send the United Nations in because they will, they will be perceived as a third party and nobody will be interfering with them. But, when, when, but in fact, this is disproved by the fact that the United Nations withdrew from Sri Lanka a while ago. No, thank you, madam. Uh, they withdrew from Sri Lanka a while ago. 
Next thing I would also next thing I would also like to talk about is a little bit of what has been presented by the side by the side of the opposition is first of all ineffectiveness of peacekeeping which was which was clearly impacted with the expectations and the burdens of the government what we are saying is that in no previous in no previous example has the United Nations proven to be an effective protection <laughs> has it proven to be an ineffective protection force on an overall scale because there always were as escalating conflicts despite the fact that the United Nations were in. For example, when we brought up the example of Srebrenica, while the United Nations were present in Bosnia, 5,000 people were massacred a couple of kilometers away from a major United Nations base. So how is government with this tool going to prevent every single conflict in Sri Lanka if potentially it escalates? So what are we saying? What is the line of the opposition today is that first of all, we do not need them because the stability is in Evolving, we have certain level of agreements already. Why interfere with another significant armed uh, force and introduce it into the region? And also that even if they would introduce the United Nations peacekeeping force into Sri Lanka, they cannot uphold the, the burden they have set up for themselves in today's debate because United Nations in no case can prevent every single conflict caused by a, any single group or any single individual, which is practically what the government today is trying to solve. And on all those grounds, I beg you to oppose the motion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, continuing the side government, moving on to the closing part, I call upon the member for the Sand. Ladies and gentlemen, the conflict between Tamils and, and uh, Singhala in Sri Lanka has been going on for about 200 years. And the question is, not whether we should fix it or not, but whether we should fix it now or not. Because if we don't fix it now, it's not just going to go away. What we're really just going to be doing is saying, man, you know who would be great at fixing this conflict? Our grandkids. And instead of doing that, I say we do it now. And the reason that we do it now is because of the unique opportunities that the current ceasefire has given us. Now, first I'm going to clarify what happened at the top of the table. So um, what is the goal of the peacekeepers? And what the first government was trying to say and that the opposition didn't listen to was that they set up peace to enforce the current ceasefire. And once peace is established, this is how UN peacekeeping works, you bring in an, in, uh, an international mediator that begins the talks that stop the conflict. So now they say that, uh, well, you know, this never works, that peacekeepers never work. Well, no, they're very bad at preventing genocides that are already underway. But the, the UN peacekeepers have been very, very good at securing peace in small island nations, split in two, where people really only know about that there's conflict there, places like Cyprus in which, in the 1960s, had massive conflict, and because of the UN, mi uh, the UN mission there that split it up between Turkish and, and, uh, and Greek, the Greek half is now in the, in, the U is in the EU, and the Turkish half is doing very well prosperously. So we see this has worked. A mo another one, a small island nation in South Asia, forgive me if this sounds familiar, is East Timor, where we had three missions, one to supply peace, another one to bring in a transitional government, and a third one to make sure that peace was kept. And then, here's the thing, we left, and the East Timor still stands today. And so we see that, yes, Serbanitsa was a tragedy, but this is a very different situation. And in situations like Sri Lanka, they've done exceptionally well. Then they say that they just stand by, but as the first government's already told you, they don't do this. Their mandate has changed. They have a stronger one. In 2002, it was changed that, uh, that the mandate is not just not shoot until sh shot at, but it was expanded to include that definition to civilians. So the problem that you addressed, is, they've already told you, it's been solved. So this brings us to the new matter. The top of the tables really talked about the first part of, of the, the motion here today, Sorry. which is sending in a multinational force. What we're going to talk about is the last three words in Sri Lanka, because I want to address the elephant in the room, the Indian elephant. The, the influence of India is what makes this a motion about Sri Lanka and not a motion about just any other peacekeeping force. Yes, sir. Yes, we have another army, as I said, and this is not good. Like, it's the only increasing of violence. Well, whereas bringing in another army made of a multinational force, headed by the UN, has solved conflicts in Cyprus, East Timor, has led to elections in Burundi, which has led to a cessation of riots in Haiti, 
We believe that this is a good model, whether or not you like it on, you know, whether you like having more guns there or not. So here's my new matters about the influence of India. I'm going to tell you about the problems. The first is that India provides arms to the Tamil Tigers. And the reason is that Tamil are Hindu, and moreover, they, they are of Indian descent. They were brought over as laborers by the British when, you know, the Brits love those guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, brought in workers into Sri Lanka, and then the, when they left, the, the Tamils were massively oppressed. So the weapons that they're supplying aren't just bombs, aren't just guns, but the Tamil Tigers have planes. And this is a huge issue, because we believe that this is one thing that's led to the conflict escalating to the degree of violence that it has. But we believe that India, being a responsible member of the UN, is going to be less likely to supply weapons if they think that they're going to be deployed against peacekeepers. So we solve for this first issue. Yes, sir. Yes, but what is happening in India, they have really a lot of violence. Did you watch the news? And as we said, on long term, it doesn't work, you know. Also in Bosnia, they, they have still violence. We forced one decision how they should establish state. We have yes, violence India there. has violence, but they're a huge country. You know, like you can't just say the entire country is involved in violence when it's really in one city. That's the whole thing, is that India is really even split on the issue of whether or not to support Sri Lanka. One part of it thinks that they like to support the Tamils, another part of it wants to uh, have stability in the region, and so we believe that there is significant political constituency in India to provide for peace for the Tamils. Um, so the next thing is that India is currently the mediator of the current ceasefire, and this has two problems. First of all, the Colombo government, the single government, is does not see the uh, Indian mediators as being legitimate because they perceive, probably rightly, that they're in cahoots with the Tamils. This is as if Russia was trying to mediate the, the, the situation between Georgia and South Ossetia. It doesn't work. <laughs> Moreover, the Tamils then don't act in good faith because they think that they've got an in with, uh, with the Indians. And, and moreover, the Tamils are fractured. They're not just one nation living in Sri Lanka. There are a bunch of different groups fighting and bombing and you know, doing all these things. And as we've seen, how my, my, the question that I want to ask this gentleman was he says, they already have a ceasefire and it's going to solve itself. But my question is, how many other non-internationally involved ceasefires have failed and what makes Sorry. this one any different? John. How do you comment on the fact that in this ceasefire, the president Rayabaska of the Sri Lanka has already t told us that he will negotiate with the leaders of Timor? Well, that's the thing is that how do you protect the negotiators? And this is what it works. They said that they can't, the peacekeepers can't prevent all violence. And I'll say, yes, maybe they can't prevent all violence, but first of all, they prevent some of it. But the more important thing is that they prevent a counterattack if violence does occur. And it's this counterattack that destroys the ceasefire, and it's this counterattack that the UN has a propensity and ability to solve. So, the third thing is that, uh, is that, so these are the problems, that India is the mediator. But, if we go in and invite an international peacekeeping force to stabilize the region and enforce the current peacekeeping, then what do you do? You make it safe enough for an international mediator who is non-aligned, who is non-affiliated, someone, let's say, like Nelson Mandela. Who doesn't like that guy? Who wouldn't listen to him? And then we, <laughs> Well, but, you know, <laughs> we all have our opinions on this, but we believe that this model of bringing in a non-aligned, non pretty well-liked person to mediate the conflict has been proven to work in other places like this. So, the only way to secure lasting peace, the kind of lasting peace we've seen in Cyprus, the kind of lasting peace we've seen in, Shri uh, in uh, East Timor, the kind of lasting peace that we're starting to hopefully build in Sri Lanka, then the only way to do it is by having an international, multinational force that can stop the influence of India in corrupting the, co uh, in corrupting the conflict and stoking the fires of hate. So, the top of the table has told you why sending in a multinational peacekeeping force. I told you why it's good to send it to Sri Lanka. I believe the government wins. Thank you. Now, to continue the debate, the side opposition, I call on first group of the last team into this debate, the closing opposition, I call on Ava to continue the debate. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. What I will do in my speech is I will firstly go through what has happened on the first.
first table of today's government and of the opposition. And I will show you why the opposition here is the one that is doing the right thing. Second of all, I will go through the extension that was brought up by, uh, by, the, first, uh, by the second table of the government. And I will show you why India here is not as relevant as it tries to put it. Secondly, I will show you why basically the things that they have said are just not correct and are misleading this, uh, this whole thing about the negotiations. And thirdly, I will go on and I will talk about our extension, which talks about uh, two very important things. Firstly, is that why peacekeepers fail in one or the other case, no matter, no matter how many jurisdictions they have. And secondly, what kind of socio uh, socioeconomic damage this will cause further in Sri Lanka. So first, let's take a look at what has happened on the first table. There were two very important issues posed on the first ta table of the government and partially also answered on the, on the first opposition table. We were talking about the negotiations. And secondly, we were talking about whether the fact that we have failed previously does really need to keep us from trying again. Now, first, let's talk about these negotiations. We said that negotiations, the, the task of the peacekeepers as such, is not basically to promote these negotiations and to acquire safety negotiations. Peacekeepers are sent into a conflict area in order to protect the parties involved. And we see that, uh, and we see that peacekeepers as such cannot really contribute so much to these negotiations, especially considering the fact that pe peacekeepers were in Sri Lanka for several, several years. And we have seen that while peacekeepers were in Sri Lanka, there was no uh, further, uh, further advance in negotiations. Only after peacekeepers went out of Sri Lanka, the real negotiations started and the, and the temporary ceasefire was reached. Now the next thing they were talking about, why would them, why would we try, why wouldn't we try again if they once failed? And here came up the, the, the extension speaker of the government and he told us about how it's, how they were successful in Cyprus, how they were successful in uh, successful in an island, no thank you, near the Asian coast. Well, those are all very nice examples, but if we're drawing analogies, let's think about which analogy is more appropriate. Cyprus comparing to the failure, uh, Cyprus comparing to the situation in Sri Lanka, or the situation in Sri Lanka a couple of months ago comparing to the situation in Sri Lanka. We see that the, these same peacekeepers went to Sri Lanka, failed and came out. And we see that the fact that they didn't really reach success here proves our point that this situation, even if they had success in previous years, this situation is not the one that, is, uh, that um, can succeed. Now, next they were talking about Indian soldiers, and they, uh, okay, Sam, go. Are you aware that the force that went into Sri Lanka a few months ago was an observational force that had no mandate to protect the ceasefire, unlike the force that we're going to send in today? No, they were peacekeepers, and the fact is that if you're trying to, 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 to shift the plan of your government in your second speech, you could do it much more tactically. We've heard that they would send the international peacekeepers to Sri Lanka, uh, and the peacekeepers, we know what we mean, but even if, even if, your point is correct. I'm going to show you in my extension why peacekeepers, no matter what jurisdictions do they have, and no matter how you uh, how you name them, whether they're observational uh, speakers, um, um, peacekeepers, or whether they're the attacking peacekeepers, no matter what jurisdictions you give them, they fail. But let's move on. You were talking about the Indian soldiers and how they're supplying them weapons with planes. Well, the first thing is the, 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 the Sri Lankan government has also their uh, weapons supplied with planes. So I don't see really what is the relevance of this supply of weapons, because if they wouldn't have the weapons supplied with, uh, with the planes, they wouldn't have it an, uh, otherwise. Now, the next point that might be interesting to tackle is the fact that you, you were talking about how India is the one that is giving weapons and the initiative of the United Nations to help there would stop India from giving weapons to Sri Lankan uh, rebel soldiers. Well, the first thing that we see here is why then, when the UN peacekeepers were in Sri Lanka, this hadn't stopped. And this is something you have to show us why the situation now would be so drastically different from the situation before. Now, the next thing is we don't really see that the, the Indian government has decided to supply them with, with weapons. We see that even if the Indian government, as a part of the United Nations, does send in those international peacekeeping troops, we still see that basically there will be people, there will be rebel groups with, uh, in, inside India that are collaborating with rebel groups in Sri Lanka and will still keep on sending this. And then they were talking about how India is, is not a trustworthy mediator. Now, this here meets a little bit of contradiction inside of 
the extension of the, today's government because firstly they are saying that India is so powerful, so, so powerfully connected with the United Nations that the fact that the United Nations are sending peacekeeping troops will now change India's attitudes towards the, the Tamil groups. And then they are saying that it's basically dangerous for us, that it's basically dangerous for us to keep situation like this because India is actually mediating and supporting the conflict. Right. So here we see the fact that if you are stating that basically the Indian, tr uh, the, the Indian troops are the mediators of the conflict and, and are therefore not trustworthy. And you, in, if you are at the same time talking about this strong connection between India and United Nations and how those influence one another, we see that your point here basically leads us into thinking that also United Nations peacekeepers won't be seen as trustworthy because of the India. Now, thank you, madam. Now, let's go m move on to our extension. First, let's talk about the peacekeepers. Why do peacekeepers fail? Okay, in one, key, one case we have peacekeepers that are simply peacekeepers without really having jurisdiction or allowance to shoot or something. We've seen this in Srebrenica. We've seen it and we've seen when it happened. The parties that were shooting at one another and those peacekeepers really couldn't do anything. It wasn't that they would voluntarily want to run away as the government tried to put it. We've seen that they basically couldn't do anything and this is why they didn't do anything. Now the next thing is if we do give them the allowance to shoot, we cause collateral damage because we only perpetuate the conflict, we bring in the third party which is also armed and we are only perpetuating the home conflict. We also have to look at the economic and social situation in Sri Lanka. We've seen that now as the ceasefire, uh, as the uh, temporary ceasefire was closed after the UN peacekeepers went out, we've seen that this huge traffic route for um, uh, the, this huge traffic route for weapons and supplies for the Sri Lankan government has been opened. We've seen that because this route was not opened, the, the, the <coughs> Sri Lankan government has uh, has raised the taxes, uh, has raised the inflation and everything, and the social situation went down. Now, so now that we're seeing that this conflict has uh, leading towards a resolution or something, we see that we should not interfere uh, and give. The, uh, and hypocritically support Sri Lankan government um, by raising taxes. Furthermore, we see that the opportunity for them to now resolve the social, uh, social situation in the country has also opened, and we've seen that now, with interfering as a third party, as someone who really doesn't need to be in this conflict and does not, cut, does not bring anything good, we are not the ones who should perpetuate it. Thank you. Now to close the debate for side proposition, I call on the government chief Lucas. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you why government must win this debate, and I'm going to begin. I'm going to begin that convincing with uh, beginning by refuting many of the points that were just made by the last speaker, and then I'm going to go on to ask two questions. Two questions that when definitively answered will clearly show that we must send a multinational UN peacekeeping force into Sri Lanka. And these two questions will be one, why the UN? And, or actually one, why Sri Lanka? And number two, why the UN? And we think that both of these answers will be clear and definitive. Now, uh, I thought it was really interesting that the last speaker got up here and she, um, she claimed that, oh, well, they're taking on such a high burden over here. They have to claim so much. They're making such large, lofty claims. But I believe it was her who in her speech claimed, no matter what the jurisdiction, no matter what the case, UN peacekeepers can never be effective. But yet, if she, she actually repeated the phrase, no matter what, twice in this claim. But yet, she completely ignores cases like Sri Lanka, where the UN has been effective, like East Timor, like in other places like Cyprus. So she's actually just completely ignoring historical empirical examples. We say sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. It's not fair to say one thing always works or one thing never works. We say sometimes it works and sometimes it don't. In situations like Sri Lanka, in situations where we have a chance to maintain a peace and create a further lasting peace, and there's not actually a systematic genocide going on, that in this case, the UN peacekeepers can and will be an effective tool. You disagree, Sean? How it works in Cyprus? They're not talking about uh, each other, these two parts that, that, that are split. They're not talking to these parts of uh, the Cyprus, they're not talking, it's not working in long term, no. Um, last I checked, that there wasn't the civil war in Cyprus that we saw in the 1960s, therefore we've made the situation better, therefore UN peacekeepers have kept to peace, therefore they are effective and they will be again in a similar situation right here. Um, but going on, 
Um, to some, some more of her points, oh, in, in terms of her refutation of ours, she was like, oh, but Indian influence won't be limited because they'll be seen, because since they're in the UN and they have UN connections, that they'll be seen as basically just uh, in cahoots. Well, last I checked, Sri Lanka was a UN member too. So clearly they too acknowledge some legitimacy and some authority of the UN. You can't claim that just because UN has connections to the UN, they'll be seen as a stooge when Sri Lanka itself is in the UN. And I don't think they see themselves as stooges. Additionally, she goes on to claim that, um, that UN peacekeepers don't work, and we've seen this in Serbia. And we say, yes, that it was a massacre and it was a tragedy, but it is also different for two levels. One, it was a genocide, and this is not what has happened necessarily in Sri Lanka, but also the mandate was changed actually because of the tragedy in Serbia. The mandate was changed in 2002, like my partner acknowledged, which you seem not to acknowledge. And we think this is actually very important in detailing the differences and the non-unique event of this argument. So moving on to my two questions that when answered will clearly show that we must send a UN peacekeeping force into Sri Lanka. Number one, why Sri Lanka? And my partner did a really good job of an extent, in his extension of explaining this, is because we have a chance, and we have an opportunity, and we have a chance and an opportunity that must be pursued. Let me go on and explain this to you. The presence of Indian influence in the conflict is inflammatory, and it is in making the situation worse. And we're saying this happens on both sides. We're saying this happens both on the side of the Tamils and on the side of the Colombo government because we think it's a little naive to claim that, oh, all the government's good or all the rebels are good. We say, no, there are guilty parties on both sides. How does this work? Well, the Indians supply weapons and finances to the Tamils, such as the Tamil Tigers, who then use them to kill Sri Lankans, civilians included. And so, and so, and so the Tamils are emboldened by this backing, and they feel, they, they feel very confident having these arms, having these weapons, which include planes and jets which, quite frankly, they don't have the capability, but India does. Additionally, the Colombo government, interesting, take note, the Colombo government feels justified in its oppression of the Tamils, in its brutality, because they can claim self-defense against bigger, stronger India. They feel threatened by the Indian influence, and that actually causes them to react even more unjustifiably with even more reactionary measures. And we believe that if we can reduce both of these justifications for continuing the conflict, that we should do that. So clearly, Indian arms and even, even the presence of India inflames the situation. So then how can we reduce this supply and influence of the Indians? Well, with a multinational peacekeeping UN force. Because what we say is that A, if the Indian government knows its arms will be used to kill UN soldiers, we say they'll be a less li lot less likely to supply these arms. If they know that the bullets they give to the Tamils are going to end up in UN bodies, we think they'll be a, less, a lot less likely to, to give them. But also, additionally, if we send in a UN peacekeeping force, what will happen is we can increase the media attention, increase the focus, increase the attention paid throughout the world on this conflict. And then we believe that when India sees this and feels the pressure, they will step back from the ledge. Because what will happen is, because India will realize that it cannot in good conscience claim to be the victim, the mere victim of terrorism, which it is, as we have seen recently, but they cannot merely claim the victim to be the victim of terrorism if they are supplying arms that are being used in terrorist acts. And we say that clearly India is a smart country. They, they, they'll know very well that they want to increase their international standing and they'll be less likely to outright supply these groups. So, we think that clearly if we can mitigate, or minimize if you prefer another word, the Indian influence, that we should do that. Because what that will do is create for a better circumstance to make peace. And this is really what the UN is good at. The UN isn't just good at going in and stopping violence forever. They're good at going in and stopping violence for long enough to create a chance for peace. You disagree? Sir, you're talking about minimizing the India's influence. Don't you think that backing them up with the United Nations will only bigger their influence? No, we're not backing up the Indians. We're not backing up the Sri Lankans. We're going in as an objective third party, which is something that was brought up. And I'd actually like to move on to that, because not only is it right to go into Sri Lanka because we can force them, we can bring them to negotiate in the table in good faith, but we can also acknowledge them as an objective actor who is the only one who can do this. Because the UN is an objective actor in a conflict that is ripe with passion, bias, and vested interests. And in such a conflict as in Sri Lanka, the UN is the only objective observer who is capable of such a thing. Their only objective will be to bring enough peace to facilitate negotiations. They don't need to do the negotiating, they just need to provide the active circumstance for negotiations. They have a legitimacy about them because they are UN, because both Sri Lanka and Indian are UN members. So you can't claim that Indian 
has even more membership because, because they don't. They're both in the uh, assembly. So what do we say? We say clearly there, are, there is the chance to have peace. And we say that when there is a chance to have peace, which they concede, oh, there's a ceasefire, there's a ceasefire. Well, doesn't that mean that now we should go in rather than go into a conflict that is more rife with violence? Doesn't the fact that there is a ceasefire now mean we should? We did in Cyprus. We did in East Timor. Let us do it in Sri Lanka. Pass the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now to close this debate, I call the final speaker, the opposition whip, Chan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable panel of judges, dear friends, what I'll do for you in this whip speech is I'll show you why, in the case of Sri Lanka, putting in the UN troops is unacceptable. I do, I'll do that by analyzing four points. Firstly, let's talk about the effectiveness. And here I'll show you why, in any case, peacekeepers in the UN peacekeepers in Sri Lanka wouldn't be effective. And it is because of that reason that the entire proposition falls today. But even if we would somehow, if they would somehow show us it would be effective, I would still show you in the second point why the need for actual peacekeepers is not justified in the case of Sri Lanka. Then I'll go about and talking about the third point is the whole India issue that was brought up by the second table of the proposition today. Then fourthly, I'll talk about what I believe and the second table of the opposition today believes is the most important issue in this debate. The socioeconomic, the socioeconomic consequences on the people of Sri Lanka who will be most effective by any kind of peacekeeping and any kind of those acts. No, thank you. I'm still at my introduction. Now, if we go on with the first point of the whole effectiveness issue. Now, this point was very misrepresented by the whip speaker of the opposition today. He said, well, Eva told you that peacekeepers are in no way in any situation effective, period. What Eva said was that peacekeepers in Sri Lanka will never be effective. And that is the main reason that side opposition today believes that we shouldn't send them in. And there are two reasons why they won't be effective, which was already pointed out in our points of information. When Eva firstly asked that we were already there, and yet we saw nothing good happen from there, and she tackled and she charge them by asking, tell us how this peacekeeping mission will be different than any other. The side proposition gave us no sufficient answer to this point. Then secondly, when I asked in the point of information, how can you expect the UN peacekeepers to be any more effective than they were in Srebrenica, for example? There were two answers to this. First one was from the first table. He said, well, We'll hope for the best, was the answer of the first speaker of the proposition today. Hoping for the best is not something the side opposition today is willing to do. What the side opposition today is willing to do is not hope for the best, but do the best sir. we can. I'll take you, sir, since okay, you Okay, do you have any better alternative? What are you doing if one group simply violates a ceasefire. We're letting the situation resolve itself. And we will show you in the second point why that will happen. But secondly, the second answer to Srebrenica was done by the first speaker of the second table of the proposition. Well, he said, we'll have a mandate change of the entire UN Will they be allowed to shoot. Now, they've already talked about that, that that will cause even more collateral damage, causing it, resulting in more people dying, causing in more people actually being hurt by the UN peacekeepers as such. So what we come to in the point of effectiveness is that it can in no way be effective. No, thank you, sir. And now we come to the even if. Even if we would be, it would be effective, let's go to the need. Let's firstly talk about the practical need and the practical implications. Now, this was never fully, um, fully presented to you by the first table of the proposition. Why we would actually have a need to go into Sri Lanka. All they said, well, we have two parties that disagree with each other and one party, which is North friend Tamil, wants to have its own country. We say that that is not just justification for us, an entire third party, to step in, breach the sovereignty, and simply say what we know and what we do is best. Secondly, what we say is that 
the situation is already resolving itself when we see the president of Sri Lanka, Mr. Rayabaska, already going into with negotiations with the leader of North and Tamil, which is uh, the leader Prabha Karen, and we already see that they are agreeing to go with negotiation, to go to with no negotiations, are already agreeing to do something about it, are already agreeing to resolve the situation sure. as such. So we see the moral justification that was brought up by the first table of we should do it because which we should do it because it's a nice thing to do is simply not enough for side opposition sure. today when considering all the collateral damage, when considering all the practical implications that come with such. Then we come to the India example where would be relevant if it was backed up by any sense of logic at all because there are four points we have to contest and Ava already contested with with the India example. Firstly, it says it's not relevant because we already were, the UN was already in Sri Lanka, yet we didn't see no change of circumstance with the, in, in terms of relations with India and Sri Lanka and such. Secondly, we say there are rebel groups in India that are supplying that uh, weapons and their airplanes and not the government itself. That's why, that's why the government itself cannot and will not do anything if the UN as such intervenes. Then yes. thirdly, which, which is a big contradiction in the whip speech as such, where he talked about the whole uh, thing that the India will stop supplying because it's in the UN and it won't want to supply weapons that will kill UN soldiers. But then he said Sri Lanka is also in the UN, which by their logic would mean that Sri Lanka wouldn't want to fire on US yeah. soldiers also, the UN soldiers also, which is completely not true. So we see an inherent contradiction in an entire extension of the second table of the proposition today. Yeah. No, thank you. Then we come to the most important part of this debate which was brought up by the second table of today's opposition, was the socio-economic consequences this would have on the people. Now this is the most important part of this debate because we believe the people inside Sri Lanka, both the rebels and both the citizens of the actual non-rebel groups are the ones that will be affected by this, are the ones that will suffer the consequences. And what Eva already told you is that the UN peacekeepers as such cause a lot of uh, caused the Sri Lankan government to close off trade routes, which in turn caused more taxation on the people, which caused more economic destability within the society as such, which, low, which lowered the standard of living, which in turn caused more deaths because of famine, because of poverty, which in turn means that the UN peacekeepers as such, who are there to protect the people, who are there to save as many people as possible, are not doing that in the case of Sri Lanka. So what this debate boils down to for the opposition today is that we need to let things resolve itself. We cannot take action just because we want to take action. We need to take action if that would mean action itself would be effective. But in this case, in the case of Sri Lanka, UN peacekeepers can never be.